By the summer of 1864, President Lincoln put Ulysses S. Grant in charge of the Federal Army. It was decided that a Union victory could only come from a scorched earth policy that would not just destroy the Confederate Army, but the lives of civilians. Towns in Georgia would be set ablaze by General William Tecumseh Sherman. But first, Grant put General David Hunter in charge of doing the same in the Shenandoah Valley. General Hunter would unleash a reign of terror, burning towns and churches. People pleaded for their homes to be spared as Hunter made his way south. In Lexington, he would completely destroy the beacon of Southern military might, VMI. Hunter made his way through the valley with ease until he reached Lynchburg, a town with a supply center and a hospital. Hunter, with 15,000 men, was stalled by Tiger John McCausland, who had one-tenth as many soldiers. McCausland played a game of cat and mouse until backup arrived. Hunter retreated to the Kanoa Valley, losing many of his men. And Lynchburg citizens were so appreciative that McCausland had saved the very town where his parents met. With this great success, McCausland would join Jubal Early in his own Shenandoah Valley campaign, wherein they would move up through the valley and see the evidence of Hunter's destruction. Years later, McCausland would describe the devastation of families left homeless and people left with only the clothes they wore. Early and McCausland advanced to Frederick, Maryland, where Colonel Patton's 22nd Virginia acted as backup in the Battle of Monocacy, allowing Early to obtain a ransom of $200,000 from the town and clearing the path for Confederate troops to make it to Washington in hopes of seizing the capital. With the city under siege, Lincoln arrived at the battle lines with the Union troops, marking the only time that a sitting U.S. president was ever under fire in combat. McCausland made it as far as Georgetown, from where he could see the unfinished Capitol Dome, but his troops were too beleaguered to take the city. No other Confederate general came so close to the Capitol. General Early then sent McCausland on a campaign to collect ransom from northern cities to be given to the survivors of Hunter's destruction. McCausland collected $200,000 from Hagerstown, Maryland, and then advanced to the fated city of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Located only 25 miles from Gettysburg, Chambersburg had a sizable population and had been occupied by both John Brown and General Jenkins. At dawn on June 30th, McCausland fired a cannon to get attention. He read to the citizens Jubal Early's orders. They were to pay a ransom of $100,000 in gold or $500,000 in greenbacks, or their town would be destroyed. Chambersburg citizens did not believe harm would come to their city. Union General William W. Averill and his troops were not far away. The people tried to stall until he could arrive. After much tense negotiation, McCausland was left with no other decision. He ordered the destruction begun. Confederate soldiers went into homes and broke apart furniture, which they would set on fire. The city was entirely in flames by 8 o'clock that morning. McCausland and his troops left behind them a blazing cauldron. General Averill and his troops arrived too late. They rode their horses through the inferno at breakneck speed to avoid being consumed by smoke and fire. The final toll of the burning of Chambersburg was the devastation of over 500 buildings, 3,000 homeless, and $1.6 million in damages. Remember, Chambersburg became a rallying cry for the North.
McCausland, Patton, and their troops would rejoin Jubal early in the Shenandoah Valley, where his forces were raiding the B&O Railroad. Union General Philip Sheridan attacked and defeated them at Opaquan Creek. Colonel Patton was shot in the leg and taken prisoner. He would not allow his leg to be amputated, a fateful decision that would prevent his recovery. The former Charleston aristocrat lost his life nine days later. Without knowledge of his death, the Confederate Department of War had promoted him to Brigadier General. Because of this unfortunate timing, he will be remembered to history as Colonel Patton. After the disastrous loss of the Shenandoah Valley, McCausland joined Lee's last effort at Petersburg. After 10 months of fighting, the city fell to the Union, as did Richmond. The North had vanquished the South. What had been torn apart by years of destructive war would now be rebound. Most importantly, the issue of slavery was put to rest, and slaves in all parts of the country were now free. Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, April 9, 1865. Tiger John McCausland was present, but could not participate in the surrender. Leaders in Chambersburg were calling for McCausland to be punished for war crimes, although Union generals like Hunter and Sherman were being hailed for scorched earth tactics. McCausland sailed to England and Scotland before going to Mexico to work as a surveyor for Emperor Maximilian. He would have remained in exile if not for Ulysses S. Grant, who intervened on his behalf, decreeing that all acts of war were done only in the name of valor for one's cause. But beyond Grant's views was a fortuitous relationship. McCausland and Grant's wife, Julia, had been childhood friends in St. Louis. The legacies of the three Confederate leaders would take different turns. General Jenkins's widow, Virginia, remarried and moved to Ohio, leaving their three children in the care of their grandparents. Jenkins' stately plantation would fall into disrepair before being refurbished and in 2009. Colonel Patton's wife, Susan, sold their home in Charleston and moved with her children to California. And if the name George S. Patton sounds familiar, it's for good reason. His grandson, with the same name, would keep the family tradition by becoming one of America's greatest military leaders during World War II. Once home, John McCausland met and married Charlotte Hanna, with whom he created a farming life and had four children. McCausland built the family a huge mansion called Grape Hill for the wild grapes that grew around it. Unfortunately, he would lose his beloved Charlotte to tuberculosis in 1891. Many legends sprang about McCausland. When President McKinley was assassinated at the World's Fair in Buffalo, New York, McCausland was reported to have said, I am glad of it. He was one of Hunter's men. However, in his later years, he expressed relief that the Confederacy did not prevail. He would live out the rest of his life farming his land in the great Kanoa Valley. He died of natural causes on January 23, 1927, survived by only one Confederate general. A self-destructive generation would pass into history, but because of them, the United States of America would learn to define itself by putting emphasis on the word united. I'll soon be free from every trial 
my body sleep in the old churchyard I'll drop this cross of self-denial and I'll go singing home to God well I'm going there to see my Savior dwell with him and never roam I'm only going over Jordan I'm only